wear your masks take your vaccines stay home stay safe hello and welcome to this episode of drs with ash and i am being joined by none other than jimmy nisham uh jimmy how are you doing thanks for joining me today let's just go back in time a little bit back to 2014 uh when you sort of came on the cricketing scene and you had like a dream debut uh, a lot of people were talking about jimmy nisham going on to become the next big thing for new zealand cricket and uh, then all of a sudden you had your delhi daredevils contract if i'm not wrong and then you went back lost your contract you wanted to quit the game and then you went out and worked a little bit on the farm then came back played the world cup final what sort of a journey is this really how many decisions have you had to make have you had to make any decisions at all um oh yeah i think everyone has to make the decisions um sort of through their career and um yeah i guess uh, for me um sort of moving away from Auckland moving away from home down to Otago was was a pretty big decision and and a pretty significant one i mean um obviously getting through to to get picked for New Zealand sort of out of the blue a little bit um and having that success early on um i sort of didn't really know why i was succeeding i guess i i sort of just went out and played and um you know success sort of came to me without um not without hard work but without actually sort of knowing why i was succeeding or, or what part of what i was doing was working and um after that um you know obviously had a few injury issues um stress fracture in my back or that sort of thing and um really sort of uh i guess fell out of love for for just playing the game and um a lot of people you know a lot of sports I guess who um grow up doing nothing else so sort of can hit that barrier in their mid 20s at at a point where they've sort of been playing for five or six years and um you sort of I suppose lose sight of why you play the game and um yeah obviously um got to the point where I wasn't you know enjoying it anymore and um just decided to to give it away and um yeah as you mentioned when I worked on on a farm or for a farming company in New Zealand for um 6 months and um I was very very lucky that um one of my close friends from Otago Michael Bracewell had, had moved up to Wellington a, another province in New Zealand and and he sort of gave me a buzz and um sort of said no nah, he, he can't sort of finish your career like that like surely you want to have another crack and and we want you to come have another crack for us and um yeah I sort of deliberated over that decision a while and um I sort of sort of came to the conclusion that um I couldn't give it all away without giving it one last crack and just to see what I could do and you now I think that was pretty significant because moving to that new province and um you know new environment um did actually sort of remind me that the game can be fun and you can enjoy it and and that was sort of my main focus and um I, I'm not sure how long it was after I played for Wellington maybe only you know 3 or 4 months um I was sort of picked again for New Zealand off the back of some good performances and um then sort of perform well for New Zealand and then that sort of put me back on the road to to yeah, play in that World Cup final right we will get to that World Cup final in a bit and your tweets after ICC changed the rules that's for a little little later but uh just as we are talking about your life away from the game and the farm and how it brought the love back to you for the game uh how did it really pan out why did you want to quit the game you said you said rightly that you might tend to lose focus and you might you know uh you, the game, it's been all about the game and you want to go away from it a little bit but how did it happen uh was there like you you wanted to give up your wellington contract right and then leave why why that sort of a decision why why did you get to that in the first place um well i think basically from when i got injured um sort of coming back it was always because i'd tasted that success i guess in my first international national cricket um that was sort of all i was focused on and um it's sort of it's one of those things that's i sort of talk about it being a bit like holding putty in your hand success in cricket is you sort of hold it gently and it will sit in your hand but if you try to squeeze it too hard it'll sort of disappear out between your fingers and um i was certainly you know trying to grip too hard onto that success that second time round and um i mean you'll you'll have experienced it as a cricketer as well so the harder you try sometimes the worse things get and and the less fluid all your movements get and um i was just really sort of playing for the wrong reasons i was playing sort of trying to prove people wrong and um people would say sort of negative things about me in the past you know and i was sort of trying to get back to where i i knew i should have been i knew i should be playing in test cricket but um it was just such a long road to get back and and it sort of sucked all the joy out of it for me um about actually playing the game and 
Um, yeah, I, as I mentioned, that was why Wellington was, was such a good move for me was because um, it was a new environment. It was with you know, mates I got along really well with and um, they were very clear when they signed me that they weren't really interested in the runs and the wickets that I was going to get for them. They, they sort of said, we want you in our team because you know, we think you're a bloody good bloke and we want you in our environment. And um, yeah, that was sort of the catalyst for me to, to not put too much pressure on my own shoulders to actually perform and um, just go out there and enjoy it. And, and obviously for me, it's something I've sort of tried to hold on to now is that that is when I'm best playing, well, playing my best cricket is when I'm just enjoying it and, and not really caring. And um, the, the easiest way to do that is to have that sort of through your whole personality. And that's sort of something I've taken on. Um, I don't really you know, care about Twitter or what people say in the media or, or any of that kind of stuff anymore. I sort of just do what I do and, and say what I say. And then people don't like it. They can go listen to someone else. <laughs> go listen to someone else. Sure, they will. Because you're, you're a lot of fun when people are interacting with you and you do give, you know, you do respond to them in the right and ample manner with that most respect, which is great to see. Uh, but uh, why, why do I get the feeling like I'm listening to someone that I'm really familiar about? Right, because when when you are when you are talking, and uh, when I go back and check your profile on Cricket Info, I see the same date of birth. I then think I'm not into the spirituality or whatever business, but I just think, why do I find there is so much similarity in personality traits? Because uh, you said uh, I was playing the game for wrong reasons at, at at times when I was looking to prove people wrong. Uh, let me just dwell a little bit on that. Do you think trying to prove people wrong is such a bad thing at all? Um, I think you have to to know how to harness it correctly. I think um, I, I sort of use it still. It's sort of part of my innate being as a person is that I do remember things and things people have said and um, things people have written. And, and I sort of, I, I, I can sort of either use them as a motivator and, and use them to make myself train hard or whatever or I can use them and let them kind of consume my mind and let them become sort of the reason I play the game and, and that sort of thing. And um, I think it probably skewed too far in that direction at times. I, I still, you know, I remember things people have said, you know, when I'm lying in bed in the morning and I don't want to go for a run, you know, I still think of you know, things coaches have said to me in the past and I sort of use them as motivation to get up and get out the door. But um, I, what, it was getting to the point where I would be thinking about it while I was batting and I'd be thinking, you know, I'd get to 30 or 40 and I'd sort of be thinking, I can't wait to get this 100 so I can shove this in that guy's face who said that sure yeah, that wasn't good been. enough. Sure yeah, exactly. And, um, and that would sort of distract me a little bit and I'd sort of get too focused on the outcome and I'd lose sight of actually what was important at the time, which was, you know, playing obviously each ball. And, um, so now I, I sort of think about it, I try and split it into two distinct things where I use that, I suppose, that grudge holding mentality um, around training and, um, you know, that sort of thing, preparing for a game, leaving no stone unturned. But then once I step on the field, I, I try and switch that focus much more to focus on enjoyment and um, just sort of looking around and, and thinking how good it is to be playing sport for a living. And, um, yeah, that seems to be holding me in reasonably good stead um, at the moment. So we'll try to keep it going. Yeah, I'm sure you will keep it going. I was looking forward to your stint at the IPL with Kings Eleven this year because I'd been speaking to Mike about how you're doing and what you've been doing over the last two years. I got some insights as well in the past. Uh, but that's, sorry, that's a separate point. Uh, now, just going a little bit more deeper into whatever you've said so far, where, at what point did you think this started consuming you or the sense of saying that you didn't know where to harness the energy? It was going in the wrong direction of trying to answer people. At what point did you feel you stripped the scale? And also on what account did you feel that people uh, might not be really understanding what I'm going through? Did you ever feel that? Um, oh, yeah, definitely. I think um, in 2015, after I had my stress fracture and I sort of came back and um, I was sort of, uh, you know, the World Cup in New Zealand had just happened and yeah, that was obviously a great thing for our our team and our country, but I sort of wasn't involved and um, sort of having to watch that whole thing from the sideline and while recovering from a, from a pretty major injury, um, I think I probably got a little bit bitter and a little bit, um, I suppose, envious of, of the guys that were involved and um, I just really wanted to get back and um, I sort of I rushed back too soon um, for that injury and I, I was sort of out 
um, playing Australia and Brisbane um, in November, I think, of that year. And um, I think you'll probably understand that playing Australia in Australia is, is hard enough, you know, when you're at the peak of your powers. And, and I was sort of just recovering from a, from a major injury. I think I'd played maybe maybe even just one first-class game, you know, since coming back. And um, I wasn't ready at all to be playing over there. And, and then the injury sort of recurred and I got dropped and, you know, was still struggling with that. And um, I think that was definitely the moment where I, I sort of was at the bottom and sort of holding those grudges and, and listening to what people were saying about me. And um, in my mind at the time, I was just using it as motivation to, you know, do my rehab and, and go to the gym and train hard. You know, for me at the time, I was thinking these are good emotions to be having. But um, looking back now, I was sort of obsessed with um, getting back and playing for New Zealand again. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, sometimes the more you want it, the further away from you it gets. And yes. um, that was certainly the case for me um, during that season of domestic cricket because I wanted to dominate so badly. I wanted to score hundreds pretty much every game. And um, yeah, it just wasn't really happening for me. And then, and as it kind of got worse and worse, it sort of, you know, fueled itself a little bit. And um, that was where I ended up, you know, wanting to give the game away because um, I was basically just playing for the money at that point because I didn't really enjoy it. I wasn't really enjoying success or anything and just playing for that paycheck and I think that's really the space you want to be in. Um, well, I know that's definitely not the space you want to be in to be a professional athlete. Yeah, definitely. You don't want to be playing for the paycheck, obviously, because uh, you get paid for what you love to do, which is something very different than what normal people do. And uh, just just something, you're 29 years old today and uh, you have, you have a fair amount of cricket left ahead of you. And do you still get the feeling that you're very different to someone, some of the other people uh, to be able to connect on sometimes when people do say, you know what, Jimmy is different. He's quite a different guy. Do you feel the, the wavelength that gets connected with people to people goes amiss sometimes uh, just because they don't understand how you're expressing yourself? Does it happen still or, or have you crossed the bridge and it's gotten better? Um. I, I th yeah, you're right. That's certainly something that has happened in the past. And I think um, people build up, a, I suppose, an expectation or like, and a, their own image of what they think you are as a person um, in our situation sort of before they even meet us. And then when you obviously have that confirmation of meeting someone, you sort of look for all the things that you expect to be there and you sort of go, oh, yeah, he is like that. Oh, he is like that. Um, when in reality, you're sort of just ignoring the things that don't fit with your view you know, the, your preconceived view. And um, I've been very fortunate um, in Wellington where that's probably the least um, judged, I guess, I've felt in a team environment. We had um, Bruce Eager at the helm when I first got there. He was a fantastic coach. And now we've got Glenn Pocknell as well, who's um, just taken on his mantle. But basically, as a, as a unit, um, we sort of accept that people are different and, and guys are going to go about things different ways. And, um, yeah, we've, we've got some different blokes in our squad, that's for sure. But I think a lot, everyone feels comfortable around each other because they trust each other that, you know, there's going to be no judgment and they can go about their work the way they, they see best. And, um, I think that's sort of filtered through, um, as I mentioned, um, about not caring what other people think of me. I think um, that gives you the belief to, to be like that when you, you know that you're trusted in your team to do the right thing. And um, I sort of just carried that through to, to New Zealand when I got picked again was... Um, just to trust in, in my own ability and trust in what I thought was best. And, you know, if people were behind my back or writing articles or whatever about how they disagreed with what I was doing, then, you know, that's their problem, not mine. Right. I, 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 I'm just digging deeper into this because I seem to understand every bit of whatever you're thinking and how you've gone through it. Uh, because trust me, Jimmy, I've gone through everything of it in a slightly different way. Uh, maybe because hmm. we live in different parts of the world and the cultures are completely different. Uh, but something why I dealt on, dwelt on this part a little bit more was because to ask you the next question. When people are constantly judging you and have this image and drawn a creative about you in their heads and said, hey, you know what? This person belongs to this box. We'll put him there. And this is exactly how he's going to behave. This is exactly how he's going to perform because of these behavior patterns. So how, does, how is it for you? How do you make decisions? Supposing, let's say you're playing in the middle and you want to take a bowler on and you don't want to play a high risk shot or something. Does it play on your head because people are going to judge you on the basis of what you were in the past? How difficult is it to make decisions? Um, yeah, I think it's 
it's I think you have to make decisions based on what you think and not based on how you think they'll be perceived by other people and um I think yeah you're right that, that's certainly something that I've fallen in, into in the past is um sort of being out there batting and going oh yeah I think I can really take this guy down and then the little voice in the back of your head goes oh no but if you get out you know the coach will be angry at you or whatever but um, I think what my experiences have taught me is that if you second guess yourself, that's when you're going to make a mistake anyway. So once you're thinking something like that, I think you just got to trust your own ability. And um, I think, yeah, uh, sorry to harp on about it, but I think at Wellington, um, we do really believe in that. And, and I think of a specific example um, at the very start of last season playing T20s and um, I hold out to long on to a spinner and maybe the 12th or 13th over and um, I was sort of quite angry at myself about it and uh, it was a pretty bad shot and um, you know I was I was sort of not glum but I was a bit disappointed in myself we ended up winning the game anyway so it didn't matter but um, the coach came up to me before the flight um, the next day to go home and Glenn Pocknell and he said um, what, what do you think about your dismissal yesterday and I was like oh, yeah no nah, look I know what you're going to say like it wasn't great um, I should have like taken more responsibility and finished the game off by myself and all that kind of stuff. And he sort of looked at me. I mean, I, I disagree completely. And I was like, oh. And he said, when you're going out there and you're confident and you see a spinner and you think you can take him down, just take him down. Like I'm not interested in you trying to take the sensible options and and sort of be a leader and all that kind of stuff. I want you going out there dominating guys and and you know playing your shots and and we understand that every now and then you're not going to get it right and you're going to get out. But that's for the guys batting six, seven and eight. They can fix that. Like it's their job to bat as well. And I sort of felt quite liberated by that because it was sort of like the coach, yeah, believes in your decision. Um, and if you get it wrong, he's sort of like, oh, I, I understand where you're coming from. Like just get it right next time as opposed to always sort of second guessing and going, oh, you shouldn't have done that. I think a lot of coaches are sort of kept in hindsight where any decision that you ends up in a bad outcome is a bad decision whereas you know the game we play is quite imperfect sometimes you you make the right decision that it doesn't work and um, I think if you can justify the thinking at the time and sort of say oh yeah this is what I was trying to do then you can sort of take the odd poor execution every now and then because it is an imperfect game. Right you you speak very dearly about the Wellington team right and very clearly it's it's a place where you've uh, sort of uh, sort of rediscovered yourself it, it must hold a very special place in your in your heart uh, but is there, could there be a reason that people at Wellington understand you a little bit more and trust you a little bit more and they have a lot more confidence in you? Uh, does it make a difference when a coach or a captain uh, deals in confidence with you than just, rather than just bare facts? Does it help you perform better as a cricketer just as far as Jimmy Neesham is concerned? Does that work better? Um, I think it's a balancing act. I think um, you don't want to move too far into fantasy when you're talking to people and you know, telling them they're the best batsman in the world and, you know, they can play any shot they want and, and that kind of thing because I think then you'll probably push people too far. But um, I think, honestly, the reason it works so well in Wellington is is because I think of our kind of four or five or five or six sort of most senior players, um, we've all had really different journeys to get to where we are. And um, there's so much diversity. We've got guys like, Hamish Bennett and Logan Van Beek, who came from Christchurch and obviously moved to Wellington to have another crack at it. Um, Michael Bracewell, as I mentioned before, came from Otago. Um, we've got Devin Conway, who's all come all the way from South Africa to try and play for New Zealand. And um, There's such a diverse mix of you know, backgrounds and journeys that everyone's sort of more curious about what other people are thinking rather than sort of saying, you know, I know better in your situation. Because I think guys understand that um, they don't have the same experiences and um, that was one thing I just really enjoyed turning up was just turning up with a new book, an open book, and just being like, right, this has been my journey so far, and um, sort of explaining to guys sort of why I was there and, and what I wanted, and um, sort of getting those journeys back. It sort of bonds you as a group, and, and you sort of move forward together. And um, I think we've, yeah, I think we've won three trophies in the two years since I've moved there. So um, it's obviously. Yeah, going pretty well for us as a group at the moment. Right, wonderful. Now, in this entire conversation, Jimmy, there's some, there are some things that have really stood out for me. Uh, one is when you said that uh, 
you missed a certain, I mean, which obviously I said as well, you missed a certain amount of, of your career moving away from the sport. That's one. Then the one thing that you say is, I don't care. I'm honest. There are no, you know, there is no, there is no like grace. It's either black or white. You're very decisive. You're very honest. And you're, you just don't have this, you have this no blinkers in front of you, right? And when you are, when you are this way, when you are like, it's just either black or white, how do you, how do you manage to communicate, peop- communicate towards people without having to, you know, push them on the wrong side of the button? Does it, has it happened to you before? Or is it something that you're very good at with dealing with people's emotions? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think um, as a leader in a group, um, you have to be quite aware of, um, I suppose, how you're perceived by other people. And um, I think, yeah, it's a hard one to say. No, no I don't really temper the things I think because I'm afraid that other people will be offended by them because I think um, there's a lot to be put in the value of being honest in a group environment like that. And I think um, if you are honest all the time and people genuinely believe that you don't have any hidden agenda and um, you just tell them what you think, I, I think they can take a, a lot harsher message, messages than you know, if you, if you should coat things every now and then and then um, come out with maybe a harsh truth sort of in between, I think. Um, I, I don't um, offer my opinion openly in the group environment like that because I do know that some people can take it the wrong way. Um, but what I do do is if someone comes up to me and asks me, you know, what do you think about this or what do you think about my game or, you know, what do I need to improve on? Um, I think they know that, they're prepared for an honest answer <laughs> and you know sometimes people go away and they go oh shit that was pretty harsh but I think the nature of professional athletes is that you've got to take some harsh words every now and then to get better and um, I think most people would say that they've walked away from a few conversations with me thinking Jesus lit me up a bit there but um, then it's sort of a week or so later with a bit of quiet reflection you sort of realize that um, it was probably not too far from from the truth Right now, uh, now Jimmy, because as this as the show suggests, it's DRS. Uh, we go on a cricket field. Umpire gives a decision, and we are more than happy to challenge the umpire on most of the occasions. Uh, like you make decisions, like moving away from the game, uh, get to a farm, working on a farm, play a shot, analyze the shot, but don't really go much deeper into that. Do you review your decisions? Uh, like, do you go back in your decisions and take uh, and think, hey, did I, you know what? Did I make the right decision? What did I learn from the decision? Do you do that in life or you just keep moving on? How do you do it? Yeah, I think that's the nature of, I mean, our game especially, but also just sport in general is that um, you sort of live and die by your decisions a little bit. And um, Yeah, I, I, it's definitely something um, you have to work on. I think um, I still lay in bed at night thinking about the decisions I made, the World Cup final and the Super Over, you know, going. You know, was that the right decision or should I have done something differently or, or whatever? But I think at the end of the day, um, you know, the game is an imperfect game and the people that play it are imperfect. And, um, often you see bad decisions end up in good results um, and good, good decisions end up with bad results and, and you sort of just have to live with, with what happens. And um, yeah, I think that's probably... Um, the, the nature of my success, I guess, in the game since I've come back is that um, I, I don't feel like I, I'm not holding on to the game desperately. I'm not holding on to my New Zealand squad desperately because um, it's all I have in my life. You know, I could move out, move on, move out of cricket um, reasonably happily uh, with what I've achieved. And I think that sort of freedom is, is quite um, liberating, I guess, on the cricket field. And, and when you're analysing because you sort of go, oh, yeah, I'm, Maybe I made the wrong decision then, but you know, it's gone now and we'll move on to the next one. And, and I think it's certainly not being flippant about your own performance and, and going, oh, I'll just make any decision I want and so be it. I think you, you sort of prepare as best you can and, and get out there with the information you have. But if um, you make a decision that ends up being a wrong one, you, you sort of don't you know, sit in your room sulking for a couple of days. But, do you, uh, but when you review these decisions, you definitely learn out of it, right? You get, your, get richer in terms of experience. Uh, do you or do you really process it and make sure that you correct it immediately, or how 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 did you how do you go about it more than anything else? How do you go about it when you review your decision and find out what you learned out of it? Are there any examples that you can tell tell some tell us uh, from what you've learned in your cricketing career? Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of an example. I guess the most obvious example I could think of would be um, last year in the, the one day competition for Wellington, we were chasing a score, um, I think 300 odd against Otago. And um, I was betting quite well and, and ended up having to bet with the tail and um, ended up actually slogging out and getting caught when we needed about eight runs to win. Um, and I sort of sat in the changing room afterwards. And, and it's one of those things you, you hit the shot well, it goes for six. Everyone talks about how oh, you're a genius and you won the game. And um, I sort of didn't hit it that well and got caught. Um, and then I sort of reflected on that and actually asked, I mean, that's the, the easiest way to get information is actually to ask people that you trust and, um, and ask um, Glenn Popham, the coach at the time, like, well, what did you think about that decision? And he sort of, I explained why I made it and he sort of listened and then he said, oh, I just think, you know, you've just got to trust trust the people you're betting with and, and just trust them that they can hang around with you and, and you just do your job. And if they get bold and lose, they lose the game, then, you know, at least you've still like, done what you could control. And then next week, we sort of had a similar target against Auckland and um, I was betting similar sort of situation. I just remember thinking like, okay, I got this wrong last time. Like, this is a perfect opportunity to, to get it right this time. And, and yeah, we ended up winning that game. Um, so I was not out at the end. Um, and I sort of remember thinking like, I'm so glad that I failed the first time. You know, I'm so glad that I had that chance to fail against Otago so that being a week and a half or two weeks later, I had the same opportunity to succeed. And I think um, cricket can be very random. Like it's not often you actually do get out or make the same wrong decisions a few times in a row. But I think, yeah, whenever you get the chance to, to rectify one, I think, um, yeah, I mean, that's what good players do, isn't it? And you sort of see Steve Smith or Virat Coley or Kay Williamson, you know, they very rarely get out the same way sort of a number of times in a row. And um, like I remember seeing Virat Coley after he failed in England um, the first time he toured sort of came back with a different technique. I think he held his bat up behind him instead of tapping it or something uh, and sort of had a lot of success his second tour. So um, it's what the very best in the world do. So um, you'd be foolish not to sort of follow suit. The very best in the world certainly don't repeat the same mistakes. And they are very, 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 very forthcoming in terms of making decisions where they can really take off. They don't think about the downside of it. They want to bounce off it and, and jump off the cliff. Mm. And Jimmy, uh, we've, we've had a very, very good discussion about what you did in your life and how you came back and the World Cup final. Can you tell me something about the World Cup final itself? It must have been so heartbreaking. But what is the biggest takeaway from the World Cup for you? Um, to read the rule book front to back before you start the tournament. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I think... Um, yeah, look, uh, I actually, I mean, it's a hard thing to sort of quantify really because, um, you know, so many sort of different factors and so many small margins um, literally separated probably the greatest achievement of my life from the most devastating day of my life. <laughs> and we sort of came out on the wrong side of it. And um, it's quite hard to kind of put into words um, how you kind of absorb that, I think. and. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, you sort of go back and you look at all the decisions you made over, you know, the last five overs or so and the things that, you know, could have gone your way but didn't. And um, I'm, I'm just so glad that I didn't do anything really stupid in the super over. You know, I didn't, you know, try and play a dill scoop and get bold or, you know, anything like that. I'm just glad that I just stuck to what I'm good at and just tried to, you know, slog to the league side and... <laughs> Um, it all it could have come off. It almost came off, but unfortunately, it yeah, it's just something we have to live it with. Helps you. If I was in your position, I might have gone for a dill scoop. By the way, just telling you, just to make you, if that makes you feel any better. But uh, having spoken about so many decisions and so many things around your uh, career, which is very very informative for a lot of people to take home, because it's very different to what it is in New Zealand for people in India. But one thing's for sure: are there any decision making capabilities required to respond on Twitter? <laughs> yeah, I think there, are, I think there are a lot of decision making um, required uh, to know what reply will get you in a lot of trouble and what reply will sort of be fine. I think that's the, the main decision I make um, before replying. Is I, I just imagine, you know, Kane or Gary Steed or someone reading it and whether they're going to pick up their phone and and call me the next day or whether they'll just be like, oh, that's Jimmy. <laughs> I get that a lot. I came, I came into New Zealand. 
and a lot of people when I, the first thing i did in new zealand was find out from a lot of other new zealand cricketers but what you were like because all you all i knew about jimmy was the picture that i painted uh, seeing on how you tweet and stuff like that so when i ask the first thing they say is oh well that's jimmy you know that's how jimmy is and that's pretty much what you get from most of them but how do you how do you manage to respond because it's very 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 difficult cultural shift uh, you respond to a lot of indians and there is an indianness about your response and how did you manage to catch up with that is it is it google help or how did you do it <laughs> um I, well i mean first of all it's just numbers i respond to a lot of indians because i think i got a couple of 100,000 followers i think probably about 150,000 are indian so um most of, most of the responses i do get tend to be from indian people um i don't understand any of the language which makes quite a few of the responses um, a little bit too difficult to reply to but um yeah i i think proportionately i think i would reply to more new zealanders statistically than i have followers but um yeah it always doesn't I'm seem that way just without yeah we'll see i i want i probably have about 6000 new zealand followers and about 190000 from the subcontinent i think so um and they're keeping the numbers up it's great all right thank you so much jimmy you've been such a sport and you answered without any you know no smoke screens in front of you which is exactly what i expected there's been quite a lot of learning and again thank you so much on behalf of drs with ash thank you that ah, pleasure Thank you.